Hello and welcome to Crucible of Words for more legacy action. Today we are playing Green Black Turbidets again. I am currently testing for the European Legacy Masters Invitational. This is one of the options I would like to play. Uh, whether or not I will play it remains to be seen. That's why we test things. So, what is Turbidets? Well, we are trying to make a 2020 and swing with it once. So we have Dark Depths here. We can either copy it and then the copy has no counters and becomes a 2020. We can remove all the counters with Hex Mage. To facilitate this, we have a bunch of tutors. So we can find the right pieces here. We then have a bunch of hand disruption to make sure we can pave the way. And then Pithy Needles and Not of This World to stop things that can answer us like Wasteland with a Pithy Needle. And then Caracas, they both can stop as well as things like Source to Plowshares, Prismatic Ending or whatever. To help this, we have eight pieces of fast mana to try and accelerate out. We can make a 2020 as early as turn one. And we got a few silver bullets left in our land base. So we got a ghost quarter because we're going to have Pith and Needle on Wasteland often. So if we need to blow up a Caracas, we can go and fetch a land that does that for us. Besaidu, which can kind of do similar things when we find it with the Sylvan Scrying, we can blow up a land with it. Or we can blow up things like Ensnaring Bridge, it might be stopping us. And we have a Paducah Bog that we can find with our crop rotation to exile our opponent's graveyard if we need to do that to stay alive. We got fetch land, basic mana base with some jewels so that we're a bit more robust against early wastelands on our first turn because sometimes the first turn you need to set up a little bit and then you go on the second turn. So, you know, you poke a hole with discard, but let's say you do that off of a non-basic and your opponent has a wasteland, that's going to mess up your clock a bit. So this is the list of playing. The main deck is pretty much set in stone at this point. I've rarely changed anything here. I think it's in a good spot, but... We keep testing and we keep seeing how it goes. Sideboard wise, we've got a few changes here. We've decided to go away from Leyline of the Void because Death Shadow and Blue Black Scam style decks have kind of not reanimated down so far that I don't think it's worth playing cards against it. Especially with the fact that I'm testing for a paper tournament and reanimator is always less popular in paper as well. But I think it's below 5% of the meta now, um, Black Red Reanimator. So we don't have the ley lines, which frees up a little bit more slots for more interaction with other matchups. So we've got a couple of Inquisition of Kozilek. We still have some Graveyard Hate, but this is a piece of Graveyard Hate that sometimes we can board in in other matchups. So against a deck that wants to be live from the loam in back wastelands or whatever, we can disrupt that quite nicely. Sometimes we might even want this against decks with a load of Swords to Plowshares. We can just strip them all out so that we can get there with our creature without having to worry about it getting removed after they've maybe gone and removed the first one. Because we can quite often assemble the combo twice in those sorts of matchups. But if they have plows for the second time, it gets more difficult, etc, etc. The Abrupt Decay and the Null Rod effects are a mainstay of the sideboard at the moment. They're the only thing I don't really like changing at the moment because you can just shut down so many decks with the Null Rods. And Abrupt Decay, we need to hit Opposition Agent, Blood Moon and Mage of the Moon. Then we have two Steely Resolve. Again, this is more protection against white removal and not of this world. Again, more protection. Due to eight cast sort of disappearing off the face of the earth, really. That's not that's not true. There's still a little bit of eight cast, but there's so little eight cast compared to how much they used to be that we don't have things like Apostle's Blessing to find our way through blockers anymore. We can just have more protection and different forms of interaction. So, where do I think this deck sits in the meta right now? It's not too bad against the top four decks. Well, one of the top four decks is very bad against. So it's favourable against Grixis Tempo. It's kind of evenish against the Blue Black Scam decks. It depends on the hand you have. But it's not a matchup that you don't want to play. It's, you know, it's fine. It's not an ideal matchup, but, you know, it's pretty even. And then you have the Painter, which is the third deck in the meta representation wise. That matchup's pretty good for us. We're not playing into their Pyroblast main deck. We don't really care about a bunch of their things. They do have Blood Moons that they can board in, but we are very good against Blood Moons and because we have these Abrupt Decays and Basics and we kind of use our opponent's Blood Moons against them. And obviously we've got these four Null Rod effects. So that matchup's pretty good. And then the fourth matchup is the Green White Black Depths deck, which is like a sort of slower deck with Knight of the Reliquary. And that deck smashes us to oblivion and it's really hard for us to beat. Now those are all the decks that are above 5% in the meta last time I checked. So it kind of puts us in an all right-ish spot. But there are some decks in the meta like on much lower percentages 
like um, Bant style decks, which are very hard for us to beat because they have all the tools to get us. You know, they tend to have Wastelands and Caracas. They have Uro to gain themselves life to go above 20. They have Teferi, which sometimes means we have to try and crop rotate and do things. Or if we have a Vampire Hatch Mage, you know, things can go a bit awry for when we actually try and combo off. And because we might need to hit our opponent twice, it does open us up to getting Teferi bounced or getting Prismatic Endinged. And obviously Teferi makes Prismatic Ending instant speed for our Marinage. So basically the Bant matchup is horrible, as is the Green White Depths matchup. So there are some pretty horrible matchups in the field for us. But then again, there's a decent chunk of matchups that we can do all right against. So enough rambling today. We're going to jam into this, doing some testing for ELM. So I hope you enjoy this one. Remember to like and subscribe. And if you're interested in this deck, there is a primer that I write in excruciating detail uh, that you can find on my Patreon, which is linked below. And it sort of really goes into the nitty gritty of card choices, what we're playing, cyborg matchups, everything. So if this is a deck that interests you, by all means, check the Patreon out, as well as the fact that I also do regular articles on different depth strategies. So I've got one on rainbow depths, one on slow depths, and I don't know if it will come out by the time this video is out, but there's one on mono black depths I might, that I've written that might be out by the time this is released as a video. So that's another really interesting one for you to look at. All right, enough with the plugs. Let's play some Turbo Depths. If you're looking to play Legacy on MTGO like me, why not try Card Hoarder? They're a rental service that I personally use and I found them better than other rental services that I've used in the past. So why not give them a try? So we're into round one. Our opening hand here, probably Goldfish is on turn one. We're on the draw, uh, sorry, on turn three, sorry. We're on the draw. So turn one, we're playing our Dark Depths or Thespian stage. And then turn two, we play the other one. We have a an Elvish Spirit Guy. We do need one other source of mana here. But if we find a land on turn three, then that will go off. Do I think this is good enough, though? The only thing we're trying to draw here is more mana. So we can play out the Dark Depths, and if they try and waste mana, we can then turn it into an Urborg, and that will set us up nicely. So I think this hand has got some play to it. An island. All right, opponent. A duress. We'll play out our Dark Depths and pass. Hopefully they try and waste sand this and then we can turn it into Urborg. And then we can just drop Dark Depths and Hex Mage next turn and be away. Now we could try to do that anyway. But we'll see. Two basic islands. That makes me think my opponent is playing something along the lines of um, High Tide. Spiral Tide, some sort of... Right, so this is a terrible. Um, but we can play this out. And then we can crop rotate it away, because we don't really care if this one gets destroyed. I think this is going to get counterspelled. But that's fine. The Sejuri step isn't really helping us in this situation, so... Right, Force of Will, muddle the mixture. Okay, that makes me think my opponent's playing the Thought Lash deck because that's a card you run in that, because it allows you to tutor for Paradigm Shift or Fassa's Oracle. Step through. Yep. One single card. Well, it's not really a single card, but there's loads of factors here. The Force of Will, the Islands, etc. But yes, our opponent has got themselves a Fassa's Oracle. A Paradigm Shift. So we really need to... So they got two cards, so they can just win that game now, right? All right, our opponent had the turn three there. I think we would like more hand disruption here in the form of Inquisition of Kozilek. I don't think we're going to be needing... I guess we can... Pithy Needle Thought Lash is pretty reasonable here. I don't think we need Bajooka Bog in this matchup. Uh, although, I guess we can sometimes mess up their pile with their Paradigm Shift if they're doing a pass a turn pile, but I don't think that's really good enough. We probably are looking at trimming... They're going to have bounce spells. Probably just one of the pithy needles goes here. Or is it one of the not of this world? That's, that's probably better, isn't it? Yeah, okay. So our opponent is a combo deck that clocks a similar speed to we do. They can kill you on turn two. So they can go a little bit faster than us, but they tend to, on average, be a little bit slower than us by a turn. But it's quite a wide range. Um, okay, this does do our thing, so I think we'll keep this. We need our Sylvan Scrying to resolve, but we have a Duress to help with that. 
So I think we will begin the game with a duress off of a basic. I guess we could probably play out the uh, bog there instead. But I don't want our opponent to know what we're up to necessarily. Like we're going to have to Sylvan Scrying for our deck, that's most likely. So what do we have here? Paradigm Shift, Step Through and Thought Lash. Interesting. I think we're probably getting rid of the Step Through. That's their only access to the Thassa's Oracle right now. And then we'll pass. So if we'd have played the Urborg, we might have been able to draw a Dark Depths there. But our plan is to Sylvan Scrying this turn. All right, that's interesting, isn't it? Okay, so our opponent has a Spell Seeker, but they can't play it next turn. So this might be okay for us. So I think we go black, black, play this Lotus Petal. Sacrifice our Swamp. Did you draw a Forcible? They did not. Okay, so we get our Dark Depths here. Tap this for black as well. Play our Vampire Hex Mage. And we can pass a turn and do this in our opponent's turn. They only have two mana available, so they can't Spell Seeker into Chain of Vapor or anything. Just two combo players, windmilling away at each other. Spell Seeker does not have flying, it's just a 1-1. One, one, so it's not going to be able to block. They're unlikely to have enough mana to put the Thought Lash into play. Alright. Just two combo players windmilling away at each other. I think I'm happy with how we've sideboarded here. There is an option for things like Abrupt Decay to smash their little bits and pieces up. So we could maybe take out a Thassa's Oracle with the ability on the stack if they've got cards in the library. But that's a bit of a pipe dream. We do have Surgical Extractions. If we can discard something, then we can strip all the copies of Thassa's Oracle from their deck. So I think that's probably worthwhile on the draw because we're probably under the gun here. Our opponent, whoever goes first, is more likely to be the one to try and go off first. So we have double duress. We also have turn two hex mage depths. All right, we'll keep this. This is what we kind of signed up for today. All right, would we rather have a bayou here or a swamp? I think we just want the bayou here. Let's play a Lotus Petal just in case there's any sort of force spiky type effects like Days. Very unlikely, but possible. Right, let's duress our opponent. A Spell Pierce. Okay. That seems like our opponent was really valuing that Spell Pierce doing its thing. We cannot pay for this. That makes me want to then fire off this duress, which will slow our curve down by a turn. That's the only problem here. Uh, I think we do need to do it, though, because if they Paradigm Shift then our Duress can't hit a Thassa's Oracle. We've got Preordain, Preordain, Paradigm Shift, Thought Lash. Interesting. Um, the Shift is obviously the easier way of getting there. But the Thought Lash represents a way that can sort of blunt our attack a little bit. I think we take this Shift here and make their combo as expensive as possible. So the Snow Covered Island. There's one of the preordains. Let's see if they, where they put these cards they're scrying with. One top, one bottom. Okay. Our opponent's deck doesn't really go in for removal here. So I think we jam this Yavimaya. And we can either Sylvan Scrying for a land right now. But we might want this for Besaidu later on. So we have a choice here. We can either get Besaidu or we can get the Thespian Stage. I think it's a case of trying to get the thing... All right. So this baited out the removal, the, the count spell that would have hit our Hex Mage. And um, what do they pitch for this, sorry? Another Preordain. Sure. So it's an interesting line we're treading between beating our opponent's counter spells, but also getting there in a timely fashion. We are now somewhat... Anyway, we shouldn't have played this Swamp last turn. That was an error that might end up costing us. Okay, let's play this one out. My opponent doesn't have removal, so this is unlikely to eat it. So they can play a Thought Lash now and start um, exiling cards. But exiling 20 cards at a hit is definitely a recipe for disaster for our opponent. Unless they have their combo piece in hand. Let's play this out. Let's go to tax. We could have played out our Elvish Spirit Guide as another creature to make them exile more cards. But I think having cards in hand might threaten our opponent in a different way. Let's right, see if we get a 2020 on the battlefield. All right, so now we have a crop rotation here as well. 
Let's think we'll play out this uh, board. Let's see our opponent's exile zone here. How many cards are they going to exile? They don't have to exile the full 20. They can exile like 18 and go to 1. Okay, so far no Thassa's Oracles. All right, they're taking a big chunk. Okay. I think I want to keep the crop rotation up for the purposes of uh, Spell Pierce. I don't want to use the Elvish Spirit Guide and put it into play. It's kind of awkward. But I think it's right to play around the Spell Pierce that we've already seen that our opponent has. So if they find Thassa's Oracle or the um, Cycling Spell, the Wizard Cycling Spell, then they get to win the game. So let's play out this Thespian stage. We can utilize this. Right. They have to exile 18 cards here to stay alive. There's one of the Oracles. The Mage of the Moon. The Stage of Extraction. There's another Oracle. Two more left in the deck. Paradigm Shift. A step through. That's kind of an Oracle. Definitely impacts their draws. There's another step through. Alright. Third Thassa's Oracle. There's only one left in their deck here. So they're going to mill three cards in their upkeep. Which is going to be putting them down to... 16 cards and they have to pay it all so make playing the the elvish spirit guide here doesn't make sense all right they have one draw here we don't have a land that we can fetch with our crop rotation to stop what our opponent's doing a preordain all right there's only 15 cards in their library so reasonable chance of hitting here zero top two bottom okay that's a good sign for us I imagine they have a bounce spell in their deck right now. Wizard Cycling. So they have a land to go with it. Can we do anything about this? Sadly not. Do they have the land in hand? I don't think... Do they? Oh, they do not. Okay. We got very close to losing that one, to be honest. Um, but we managed to pull through. The Magus of the Moon means we probably should have boarded in the Abrupt Decays. I have played this deck with Magus of the Moon before. So maybe I should have had some appropriate technology there. Yeah, that was a little bit loose from us, I think. Alright, let's go to round two. Alright, our opening hand for round two doesn't really go anywhere, so we're going to mulligan this one. This hand requires a green source, and we can go, but we have a Bajuka Bog, so we can't really cast our Duress. We also need another black source. We can do the ghost court trip. But I don't think this gets us there. This hand makes a turn to 2020, which is what I've signed up for. So we'll get rid of a Verdant Catacombs. I want to keep the Elvish Spirit Guide because it allows us to play around days. Am I supposed to keep the ghost quarter to play around Caracas and bin off the other Verdant Catacombs? That's the decision here that we have to make right now. I think the speed we're going means that probably we don't need the Ghost Quarter. And that might come back to bite us. Although we're more likely to draw a green source for later on down the line. And we also do have the Spirit Guide. Sure, I've convinced myself to keep the Ghost Quarter in case our opponent drops a Caracas. A Misty Rainforest. Alright, so we have an Urborg here. Are we Sylvan Scrying now? I don't think so. I don't want to use this Elvish Spirit Guide, which might be paying for a daze in the near future. Now, hanging this out here does expose us to Wasteland. That's unfortunately a thing that can happen. The fact that we led out on the Urborg might let our opponent know what we're playing, perhaps, because we also had a Mulligan, and both of those things, like Mulligan into five and leading on Urborg, kind of indicate some sort of vampire hex mage shenanigans. All right, so we're getting a Brainstorm here. Is it going to be followed up by a wasteland to make our lives really sad? Or not? So the other option was to play out the Dark Depths first and see if that gets wastelanded. Alright, not a wasteland. Okay, I can deal with this. And we can pay for a daze. Another Dark Depths. Don't mind if I do. Let's go for Black Black on the Hex Mage. Now what flavour of Tropical Island deck are we looking at here? Alright. A Mind's Desire. Okay, so we're on Spiral Tide here. So next turn, 
we well there might not be Spyrotide, I suppose. There might be the reset tide that Bosch and Roll played a little while back with the green mana. So next turn we can go and find a Thespian stage using our Sylvan Scrying. Alright, we've got black mana as well. Okay, so we might be looking at ad nauseum tendrils or something here. Or it could be the the deck that is the bubbling muck deck as well, but that usually just runs underground seas. Doomsday. All right. Doomsday with my desire. Yikes. So they've got enough lands that our ghost quarter won't interact with them very much. I do not think Doomsday is a good matchup for us. Doomsday has fallen away a little bit in the meta, which is good for us in general. But when you do come across it, it's uh, pretty bad news for us. So are we going to win this game? Chances slim. Our Urborg also helping them to cast their Doomsday. All right, let's have a look at their list because there's obviously some weird stuff going on here. So we've got Mind's Desire, Dark Petition, Tendrils of Agony. Okay, so it's Ad Nauseum Tendrils with Doomsday. Uh, how are we looking? Artifact Mana Lotus Petal is there. Lion's Eye Diamond is there. Okay. We're almost certainly losing this game. I just want to see what's in our opponent's list. But they don't have loads of Lotus Petals in their deck. So this is not really going to be a great matchup for our Null Rod effects. Um, now what is the question? I guess we're Sylvan Scrying here. We don't really have any fun lands that we can find here. We just have to grab our Thespian Stage and somehow hope our opponent doesn't get there. In two turns. I'm just doing this so I can see, because our opponent's playing an unorthodox build, so I want to see what they've got. If this was like a game three or something, I would just concede at this point. Unless our opponents misbuilt their pile, which is very unlikely. Because they've got three lands to work with, so it's very hard to mess up a pile from there. Right, they're doing a brainstorm. This should be enough to win the game. A consider, yeah. So they're going to mill one of these cards. Right, so a second Lotus Petal. They're doing a cycle. They're going to name the... Thassa's Oracle is the last card they're going to play out of their hand. Sure. So we saw another Lotus Petal. That's two... Three, four Lotus Petals. Is that worth bringing in Null Rods? Tough to say. What I do like is Surgical Extractions and Inquisitions here. I don't really think we're trying to not of this world, this matchup. I think our opponent is the aggro here. And Pithing Needle can name some of their things, but not a lot of them. Like we can name some of their cyclers. So now it's a case of would I rather have these Pithing Needles or a little bit of way of disrupting their mana? Fire these Null Rods that can come back to bite us, though. I think a couple of Collector Roofs, because they at least beat down, is worthwhile to me. But other than that, I don't think we're boarding in any others. Um, Pajukabog, unlikely to be that relevant here. So Jury Step might be, though. Besage, you might be. Ghost Quarter can be. Yeah... Do I want to take out this Bajookabog in favour of having another Needle back in or a Null Rod? Like the Null Rods will shut off our own Lotus Petals. The idea is we're playing the thing out turn one with our Lotus Petal because we get to see how we're using the Petals. It makes them bad draws later on though. But this game isn't going to be about very many draw steps, I don't think. I think I'll keep the Bajookabog in as a black source that we can turn to other things. Is that worth doing? If we're slowing the game down, what's our opponent's backup plan? Like Cabal Rituals and things into Tendrils. I think I think I'm going to keep the Bajuka Bog in. I don't think it's great, but all right. What does our hand do? We have Duress, Surgical Extraction. I'm going to have to find our combo somewhere along the lines. Yuck. Um, so my normal philosophy is you have to keep a hand that makes that has access to a 2020 we don't have that we have access to dark depths which is fine i think we do have to keep this because this matchup is kind of grim and the duress surgical extraction punch to take out a doomsday should make a big difference and we also know if our extraction will resolve when we cast it all right let's duress our opponent and see how bad it is they kept seven so i'm expecting to be dead Edge of Autumn, Mind's Desire. So we can take the Mind's Desires and 
that leaves our opponent in a slightly awkward spot. So what we can do now is we can, when they're about to get up to six mana to cast this Mind's Desire, we can then extract the other one and kind of blow out their plan if they play a little mana ramp. I guess Mind's Desire is an interesting one because it lets you go off because you can't, um, you can cast a Doomsday, then you've got all these spells that you've got in reserve that can just win the game for you. Okay, another crop rotation. We know they've got a Street Wraith, but I don't think we want to do that. I think I'd rather do some crop rotating shenanigans. Our opponent does not look like a Force of Will deck. We didn't see any before. Okay, so we've got a Brainstorm here. There's a Misty Rainforest we knew about. We don't know what they put back with their Brainstorm necessarily. Could be the Edge of Autumn, they might not be down for that. Could be the Besagey. I doubt they put back the Mind Society, but it's possible. A Ponder, sure. Let's see if they shuffle or keep. They shuffled, okay. I don't think we fire these off because we might draw something that changes how we want to play this. Another crop rotation. Okay, uh, so we can just combo in our opponent's end step here with three crop rotations. They'll never see it coming, I hope. But do you have this Besage you though, which is something we have to worry about. But are they going to keep open two mana for Besage you? I think it's worth taking, because of the speed this matchup can go, I think it's worth not trying to play out the Pithing Needle here to name Besage you, when we can potentially just kill them this turn if they don't play, if they don't have two mana up. A Dark Ritual. Okay, so that's three mana. A Doomsday. Understood. So we can surgically extract this Doomsday once it resolves. And mess with their pile. Right, so they've assembled their Doomsday pile. If they go to draw anything here, okay, there's the Besagey. It's just floating and doing an Edge of Autumn line. Right, we're going to respond. We're going to exile this Doomsday, paying two life, because our lifetime doesn't matter here. So let's shuffle their pile. We can also work out what's in their hand and their library and how best to beat that if we can get them with a, a Veil of Summer. Very rude. Um, opponent's got two cards in hand. They're going to have another mana source. It's unlikely that our crop rotation here makes a difference because we can crop rotate for a Ghost Quarter here and hit this Tropical Island. But if our opponent just floats mana, then they're still going to win the game. So it doesn't actually impact anything apart from shuffling their library, but it also means that we don't get to combo on our turn. I think our opponent just has us here. All right, so what have we got? So the library is consider Street Wraith, Lion's Eye Diamond, Tassa's Oracle. Okay, so we kind of hope that they hit the Lion's Eye Diamond off this draw. They have Brainstorm, Dark Petition, Mind Desire in hand. Okay, so they need their Lion's Eye Diamond to go off if we get rid of their Tropical Island. All right, there's a lot of information I have to try and work with there. So they have to have the Lion's Eye Diamond. There's a Brainstorm here. Do we mess this up? I think we're supposed to, if we, in response to the Veil hit this, they would just float blue, so it doesn't actually make the difference. And then they draw those other three cards. They play the Lion's Eye Diamond. And then the Lion's Eye Diamond cracks in response to the draw of the Street Wraith. Yeah. So I don't think we had a line that beats that. Um, we can try and shuffle their library right now. And see if they we have a 50-50 shot of ghost quartering away their land. Uh, is is this a May shuffle though? May shuffle, okay, so that's not actually gonna work, but our opponent might not know that. And they might go for the shuffle, although it's very hard to, on Magic Online, to not, they did not shuffle, sure, yeah, okay. And they have a consider line. So it's gonna draw that final card. And there's a Thassa circle, yeah. This matchup is very difficult and we just did not get there, unfortunately. All right, let's go to round three. 
Now we're on the plate. Our hand does not seem like where I want to be. I'm going to mulligan this one. This one seems better. We can keep this. I don't think we're going to need all of this hand disruption. I think we'll throw back a duress and be done with it. Thoughtsy is just the better discard spell. So Let's see what you're working with there, opponent. Okay, another Doomsday matchup. So this is going to be really bad news for us. Again, but we're off to an okay start. We need to find a black source or a crop rotation. Either of those lets us go. There's an underground C, and we're probably not seeing the brainstorm yet. So we can be relatively sure that our opponent's hand is safe for us to play into. A lotus petal, you say? I don't mind if I do. Did they draw a force of will? We can play, pay for days, but oh no, here's the brainstorm. They're digging. But it's unlikely they're going to have Force of Will and Blue cards. So they need to find both of those in the top three. But Days is relatively uh, straightforward for them to find. I would imagine it's going to be the easier hit for them. So the Elvish Spirit Guide should do enough here. All right. They did not have Force of Will Blue card. All right. Interesting to see Doomsday twice in one league. I haven't seen it around for a little while because Walkish Bowmaster has been so good against it. Okay. They found a Ponder. So the top card of the library they know. I'm imagining they're going to shuffle here. Okay, they did shuffle. Underground C. A brainstorm. I'm not sure they can... They'd have to find, like, Lion's Eye Diamond, Doomsday, and then have the Edge of Autumn to go again with the Lion's Eye Diamond pile. We're going to make our 2020. All right. So we got game one against Doomsday, so that's something I'm happy about. So these cards seem useful. I don't think this is really about doing not of this world shenanigans. I think we're just going to do a similar sideboard to last time. Do we want to make any other changes here? Or a pin needle or a null rod? Or do we just want a couple of protection spells in case our opponent goes slower? Maybe we do want a couple of not of this world. Uh, or one of not of this world even. Uh, maybe get rid of the bog for another one and try this. Not sure what the new technology for Doomsday is these days that has people back on it, but the last build was very stormy Doomsday. So maybe our opponent is on the same thing and somebody has posted this deck and people like it. Uh, lots of disruption, but no real route to winning the game. And our opponent will win the game if we give them time. So I think we have to mulligan to something that has disruption and ways of potentially winning the game. So I think this. This covers that. Do I want... I don't really know if I want this Collector Reef, to be honest. I think I'd rather keep the Hand Disruption, Crop Rotations, and Surgicals. Mr. Wayne Forest. Underground C. We're looking for a Ponder or Preordain here. A Ponder. I think what we're going to do with this hand is lead off with the Duress rather than the Thought Seize. Most of this deck is spells, but if they have some sort of Cyborg Duke into Shouldered, that's going to be a thing they cast on turn four or three, most likely. So we can then worry about that later with our thought seas. Because they'll be more likely to have drawn it by the time we fire off our thought seas. They chose not to shuffle with their ponder, which is a little bit worrying for us. A lion's eye diamond. Okay. Dark depths. Okay, so we are we are getting there a little bit. Just gonna get by you. Let's duress our opponent. Doomsday, Doomsday, Dark Ritual. Right, so we'll take this Doomsday. And then our opponent's draw step, I think we surgically extract the Doomsday. And then we get to a little bit more information about what our opponent's working with. So in their draw step, we will surgically extract the Doomsday. They're left on top, so they know what they have here. They're just trying to dig into an answer for our surgical extraction by doing the second Street Wraith as well. We also get to find out if our opponent can win the game without Doomsday soon as well. All right. They did not have another win condition there. So we managed to cheese our way through a Doomsday matchup. Um, there's not any new technology I can see here. So I'm curious why people back on Doomsday. It is a powerful deck. Uh, but Orcish Bowmasters is a bit of a problem. I suppose Furless Summers can help with that. But I'm not seeing any 
by using here. So yeah, just classic Doomsday, I suppose. All right, let's go to round four. We are two and one. Uh, our hand does get there. It's a touch slow, but we've got some protection in the form of Pithing Needle and excess crop rotation, so we are going to keep this. So we get blown out by a turn one combo player. If it's another Doomsday player, something's definitely going on. Snow Covered Island, Ponder. Snow Covered Island. So it could be Doomsday, could be Spiral Tide deck, could be a Bank Control deck. This tells us they're not playing a Tempo deck because they have a Snow Covered Island. Do you want to play our Vernon Catkins now and fetch around potential Stifles? That's something to think about here. So if we play this, crack it for a Bayou, play our Pitting Needle. I think that's the highest upside for us. All right. They might have Wastelands in their deck. They're sort of one of these Bant control decks, and that's definitely a thing that we have to worry about. Okay, a Dark Depth here. So if we play this and cast Sylvan Scrying, this might bait a counter spell. And the idea is we, next turn we can play Dark Depths and then crop rotate into wherever we want. It's certainly an option. I think this is the less risky line. Our opponent isn't giving me combo vibes, but they might be combo. It's hard to say sometimes. Are we going to get Sylvan Scrying? Or does our opponent want to say no? They're cracking their Delta. We don't need this Sylvan Scrying to resolve. I'd much rather this eats a counter than one of these crop rotations. All right. Thespian stage, sure. So now we have the combo in hand with double crop rotation back up. Now the Sajiri step being in our hand is awkward because we can't get instant speed. But we can destroy things like Caracas, which is very unlikely to be in our opponent's deck here. Lots and lots of filtering from our opponent with their draws. Not sure what we're looking at here. A polluted delta. Cracking polluted delta. A thought seize. So they can't thought seize us off of our combo here. Because it's lands. So they're just going to lose one of our crop rotations. If they're a deck that's relying on counter spells to win the day, then that'll be fine. If they are just a combo deck softening up our hand, then that will be terrible news for us. Um, this is kind of awkward, isn't it? If we wanted to try and crop rotate here, it plays into things our opponent can have. So I think we play out the Thespian stage here. Because we can turn that into something else if we need to. Like a Bayou to give us black black next turn. Lim Dole's Vault. Okay, whatever our opponent's doing, it's not a fair deck. So this could be the blue black show and tell deck. Could be a Doomsday deck. Could be some sort of Thassa's Oracle type combo. We just don't know. It could be Tin Fins. Seems very unlikely with the. Island in play, but it's certainly possible. So if you're unfamiliar with Limdor's Vault, basically they look at top five cards and rearrange them. If they don't like them, they pay one life, put one on the bottom, and then do the next five cards. So if they're looking for one specific card, they will always get that, as well as being able to mess around with the other cards around it. How dead are we, opponent? Show and tell. Okay. Let's go for a crop rotation here. We'll get Dark Depths. Show and Tell Resolve will put in our Vampire Hex Mage. Now if they have like Omniscience Emrakul, we just die. Omniscience? An Emrakul? Archon of Cruelty. That's an unfortunate one, isn't it? Because we don't really have a good timings to beat that. And now we don't get to do our combo. Unless we draw a land next turn. Sure, that's awkward. Get rid of one of our bonus dark depths. So we need to draw a mana source to deploy a 2020. Okay, it's just way worse than that. Right, we can just F6 this turn. Our opponent can show us some more cards in their deck. They're going to have Emma Court in here. I think that's a given. Seagate Restoration for free. That's that's a lot of cards our opponent's just drawn there. Maybe they're Minds Desiring, which means we get to see a lot of their deck. Shoulder of the Apocalypse. Sure, so they can draw their whole deck here. 
want to see what they're up to, get a bit more information, and then go to sideboarding. Show me the Emrakul. And the Ponder. It's why they're not just drawing with Grizzlebrand, because it costs them 7 life and they gain 14. Might as well just get. Maybe they are just trying to get Storm and do something cool. There's the Emrakul. That's scoopable. They don't need to play any more cards and show us any more of their deck. Okay. So, I would like some Inquisitions here. And I think there's definitely an argument for Surgical Extractions here. If we're playing 10 Discard Spells, if we can strip out their Show and Tell and then extract it, that's going to be okay for us. Uh, Pit the Needle can name Grizzlebrand, which is okay. Not this world. I'm not sure how useful that's going to be in this matchup, to be honest. I think we'll take out one of the Pit and Needles. I'm probably working something along these lines. They might have some sort of reanimated duke, so I want to keep the Bajuka Bog in. Yeah, I guess. Lots of combo decks today, which is not where we want to be, really, with combo decks to go off a little bit quicker than us. But that's why we have changed our sideboard to the additional Inquisitions. We're on the play. Uh, I've got a bit of a weird hand. Like, we can definitely do some things here. Do I think it's going to be quick enough to beat their deck? Possibly. Let me keep this. Okay, and then melding into six. I think we lead out on Dark Depths in case our opponent does an early show and tell. As weird as that looks. But we can also play the Lotus Petal to keep ourselves covered. Then if we draw any mana source that's instant, that any of our fast mana sources, so that's seven cards, we can deploy Thespian Stage and make a copy. If we draw a black source, we can then play the Hex Mage. So weirdly, I think it is right to play our Dark Depths straight out, and then this Lotus Petal. We could try and crop rotate into a win next turn, or into a 2020 next turn, but I don't think in the face of all our opponent's blue mana, that's where I want to be. But if we make them spend two cards to do their thing, maybe that works okay on us, because we started on high resources than they did due to the mulligan. Not convinced, though. A Pithing Needle. Sure, they're going to name Thespian Sage or Vampire Hex Mage. We have both, so it doesn't really matter. Here. Vampire Hex Mage, sure. So we're looking for fast mana this turn. We did not find any fast mana. We did, however, find a Thespian's Stage. I think we'll play out this forest first. Like We could try, and try to go here. If we play out the Thespian's uh, no, we, we don't have quite enough to do this, do we? No, okay, we'll play out the forest so we can cast a crop rotation without losing our Lotus Petal. And next time we'll play Thespian Stage. And I hope it gets there. A Brainstorm. Our opponent might have something like Shouldered's Edict. But we can't really do anything about that. Our deck only makes one creature token, and that's Merit Lage. We could run County Garden as a tutor target in our deck if Shouldered's Edict was everywhere. But so far, even the blue-black decks are tending to run one or two of them tops, which is something we can beat with discard rather than having to play a not very good land in the county garden. They shuffled off their ponder. That's good for us. We'll play out our Thespian stage. All right. We are representing our combo. If they show and tell, we can put in a hex mage. We at least have something to sacrifice to an Archon of Cruelty, if that's a thing we want to do. We can also put in our Yavimaya, so we have more mana. We've got some options here. Just two combo decks, we're milling each other. The story of this league. For Suvan Drifter. Okay. I'm going to have a blind hit here and just get us. Okay, they did not. So they have a chump blocker, is what they've got here. And we keep the copy. All right. Um, they weren't technically dead yet, but we do have a crop rotation that would give us a jury step, so that might be enough. Well, they didn't fancy it. So I think we just run it back again. This time we're on the draw, so our opponent is favoured. They had a lot of stuff to try and answer what we were doing. I guess the other thing we might want here is, pith is um, Abrupt Decays over some Pithing Needles here, actually, for Vesuvian Drifter. Uh, yeah. This goes on turn two with Hand Disruption. Like... That's fine. So we get Bayou and Duress. Then we untap, crop rotate into Urborg, play Dark Depths, play Hex Mage. 
That's a pretty good curve. That's what we came here to do. Inquisition of Kozilek. I think the duress is still better here than the Inquisition. Is that true? Yes, I think so, because we can hit a force of will if we need to with a duress. Flutterstorm, Limdol's Vault, Thoughtseize. Hmm. Yeah, this is an ugly one. I think we have to take the Limdol's Vault here. I don't think we beat the Grizzlebrand shenanigans. So they're probably going to Thoughtseize us this turn and hold up Flutterstorm. So the crop rotation line is right out. We can Inquisition them to take their Flutterstorm. What do we lose here? It's probably the crop rotation. That's our most direct line to win in the game here. They went for the Hex Mage. That's interesting. So they clearly think they can rely on this Flusterstorm. I don't think that's true. Um, do we want to take out this Flusterstorm now? Or do we want to take out their Grizzle Round activations? I think we just want to... F if we play this, they're just going to cast their Flusterstorm. And that's fine. Unless they want to save their fetch hand. No, they don't want to save their fetch hand. They do want to save their fetch hand, sorry. So they've got those three cards in hand. Not that exciting. So we can play out our Dark Depths. Let's ponder from our opponent. So we have a choice next turn, depending on what we draw. We might be able to assemble a combo, or we might be looking at just pitting needling the Grizzle brand to stop shenanigans from happening. So we play this one out. We... Crop rotate this into a Thespian stage, then we play this, and then we're not anywhere still. So I think this turn is the cast pitting needle turn. Is that true? If we if we turn the if we crop rotate this into Thespian stage now, then this can cast a pitting needle. They're probably gonna crack that polluted delta in response. Yeah, there it goes. But we're gonna name Grizzle Brand. So even if they put in a big monster, we don't have to worry about it as much. Okay, so next turn, we get to make a 2020. And we also then get to Sylvan Scrying for the Sejiri step to win the game. Show and tell. Okay, so they're probably going to put this Grizzle Brand in. We didn't have anything to put in here. Yep, yeah, so there's a Grizzle Brand. This can't really attack profitably. Um, we play out a Lotus Petal, I think so. They knew we drew that as well, because otherwise we would have put it in for free. Well, I guess maybe we wouldn't have, but I think it's very likely we would have all played the previous turn. All right, so our opponent has a chump blocker. It's uh, a big old chump blocker, but it's not going to be good enough versus our Sylvan Scrying. A brainstorm, sure, this can do some work for our opponent. If their Grizzle Brand attacks, that puts us in an interesting spot because does that mean they're going to put in an Arcan of Cruelty and kill our guy or have a Shoulder's Edict? Or does it mean that they're just testing us? Hmm. I don't think... I think they would chomp block here. I guess they're brainstorming so they know what they've got so maybe they have to hope that we make a mistake and they just want to gain that 7 life. Oh, interesting. Okay, they did not value the 7 life. 2020 on the road. Cast this Sylvan Scrying, paying around a daze if we need to. With our Sejiri Step. Play Sejiri Step. Draw a creature pro black. And bash you for 20. Hopefully. If they do have something like a shoulder disease, we do just die here. Alright, we won the game. So we are doing alright versus these combat decks. I think having the extra Inquisitions is certainly helping. They're flexible against a wider field as well. So... All right, we are three and one going to the final round for the four one. Our hand does not have access to dark depths. I don't think we can keep this. This hand, on the other hand, uh, makes a turn two twenty twenty. So let's throw away one of our burning catacombs and hope our turn three kill is good enough. We do kind of have to show our hand a little bit here. We're not playing, so we could play the hex mage turn one to play around thought seas. Let's play around thoughts use slash grief. But it does play into removal. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I think removal is going to be more prevalent than thoughts is. 
things like lightning bolts, source to plowshares, fatal pushes. I think we're correct not to play the hex range out. But it's not completely cut and dry. It's probably like 60-40 given this meta. Oh, no. Why would you do this to me, opponent? I thought we were friends. Um, I guess we still play the depths out. In case our opponent... Uh, so our opponent basically kind of attack this Caracas for mana. Otherwise they'll die. Unless they have a plow right now and they plow our Hex Mage untapped and have Caracas up. That would be awful. They did not have that. Okay, that's step one. You don't get to cast any... Sp okay, our opponent has a Solitude in hand. Very rude. Are we supposed to... Because they can chump block and then just get us that way. So that doesn't really help us unless we draw a... So if we make a 2020 now, we're relying on drawing a tutor to get through this Arkham of Amiria. I don't think we want to do that. I think we just want to draw a duress. Okay, we at least get to see what our opponent's doing over there. Let's have a look. I don't think this duress is going to hit. Oh, it did. Fable of the Mirror Break, and they do have a Solitude. Okay, so we correctly played around some stuff. And I don't think we want to help our opponent's life total out by using... By playing the Yavimaya, not that it really makes a difference. We can play that next turn and it still counts as mana because it will allow our Dark Depths to tap. But mana isn't really the problem right now. It's that we've got no action. Right, so they drew an Ancient Tomb for turn. No attacks. We've drawn an Urborg. I think we are doing Verdant Catacombs just to thin here. We don't have any action going on. Fresh to thin is very marginal at best. But in this situation, we might as well. Cavern of Souls, naming Elemental, I suspect. Yep. Right, they're tapping out of for another Archon, sure. So now they might start attacking? No. Still cowardly. So then a turn, we'll fetch a Bayou here. If it comes in tapped. But we might as well, we've got the time to work with. Tutor effect. A Thespian Stage. What does that do for us? Um, not a great deal of anything, as it turns out. I think it's better than playing these, though. So I'm going to play this one out, tapped, and then we're going to pass the turn. We're just waiting for a tutor effect, and for our opponent to tap their Caracas. And we can just get them with a Sajiri step. Maybe. Alright, we've started the beatdown. We have entered beatdown town. I don't believe our opponent's going to have a moon effect in their main deck, so I'm going to fetch the things here. All right, um, probably should fetch with this. Uh, I wish Spirit Guide doesn't do a great deal, does it? Do you want our opponent's life total? I guess we already have the Airborg in play, so it's not really making it not much of a difference. Is casting this guy useful? Possibly in the future, because what this allows us to do is block a scary creature down the line. We need to find an answer for this Caracas and then an answer for this Solitude. So we have plenty of discard that can hit a Solitude. And we've got a bunch of Pithing Needles as well. All right. A seasoned Dungeoneer. All right. The clock is very much on. So what we could do this turn is make our 2020, since they can't Solitude now, but then they will Solitude our art keep. And we didn't really have an answer for that, so we're not, we're not doing that. Right, there's the planes. We don't also get, don't get to chump block season dungeon here either, which is sad. Our deck's not very good against getting the monarchy and stuff because we tend to kill them if we hit them with a the creature. All right, let's draw for turn. Not of this world. Okay, this gives us a shot. Uh, due to the, how much damage we're going to be taking, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So we'll be dead on the next turn, I think. So we will have to go in a sec. Understood. I don't think they have to tap this Caracas now, which is a slight problem for us. Yep, so forge you onto the Dungeoneer. Okay, a Chaos Adventurer. This does us another 5. So we're taking 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So we are dead on board. Bit awkward. 
Oh, what? Whenever I play against the initiative with this deck, they always have their one off Caracas without fail. So Duress, I don't really like that much in this matchup. Uh, the Inquisition is better for the most part. Steeler Resolve, I like, and we need some amount of decays to deal with some of their nonsense here. The Astronaut of this world is also nice, but a case of where do we fit it in? Maybe it's better than one of the Inquisitions. Sure, I can go with that. Um, we don't really need Bajuka Bog in this matchup. So we have the Inquisition back in there. That looks sensible to me. And we will start off. Okay, what does our hand do? It makes a turn 3 2020. I think that's too slow. What does this hand do? Nothing. All right, we may have reached the uh, the stage of the league where we mulligan into oblivion, but let's see. This is close. This is very close. We'll keep this. We'll get rid of a bonus Dark Depths and the bonus Thespian Stage. So, we have a choice here about what we play out on turn one. If we play out Dark Depths and then we draw an Herbal, we can go on turn two. But, if they jam a Blood Moon... We're going to want our basic. So I think we do just play out the basic here. Now we don't have a direct route to the 2020 immediately. We can just do the slow play in it out. But this way we can crack this for a swamp. And that gives us the ability to abrupt decay if they have a blood moon. We're going to try out here. A chrome mox. Let's see what they imprint here. A Magus of the Moon. Does that mean they have another Magus? I think you would probably value the Magus quite highly here. But maybe they're just saying we want to make an initiative guard in turn one. And just try and win the game. Fourth Eolingus. They did not pay the X. That is an unfortunate error from our opponent there. That's certainly given us a chance there. And they binned off a Magus of the Moon to do it. Uh... Okay, so we have a Bayou now. If we play the Bayou out, I think that's preferable to playing out the Dark Depths right now. Because this means we have Black Black and Dark Depths for next turn. Because if they play a Blood Moon, we may as well get the free effect of playing our Dark Depths and then blowing their Blood Moon up and getting a 2020, if that's the thing we want. Okay, a Chromox. Our Prince spent pretty much their whole starting hand and hasn't put anything into play yet. But impacts the board. It's going to be a seasoned Dungeoneer. Sure. And they're going to get themselves a nice little land. And they're going to play the plane straight away. They have one card in hand. In our upkeep, we will crack this for a basic swamp here, so we have our colours. All right, we'll play Hex Mage. We'll play Dark Depths. We'll pass the turn. They are scrying. Let's see where they put these. Zero top, two bottom. Okay. That means they did not find the thing they were looking for. Well, they might have done off the top, but... Another seasoned Dungeoneer. That is fine. We have won the game, I think. They've got no cards in hand. They don't have lethal damage. We have a 2020 flyer they can't block. And now they're showing us some extra bonus cards from their deck. Ancient Tomb. They've drawn the Ancient Tomb. They only get one of these triggers because it has protection from creatures after the first trigger is resolved. Can I have 2020, please? All right. So for the final game, do we want to do anything differently? I don't think so. I like our setup here. Lots of layers of protection. We have the turn two combo here. I think we keep this. We do have an abrupt decay. So if we find a black source, we could play cautiously and play our Verdant Catacombs out so that we can access our Abrupt Decay to beat Blood Moon. The question is, how much pressure are we going to be under? If the answer is lots, then... All right, what is this? Is this just a Blood Moon? No, Fable and Mirror Breaker. Okay, so I would love to draw a basic Swamp this turn. That would be a perfect draw, a Thoughtseize. Uh, okay, this works too. 
we can thought seize our opponent here. See what they are working with. Seasoned Engineer, Swords to Plowshares, Solitude. We will take the Swords to Plowshares. Force them to at least expend both of their cards. Because they're going to get a treasure this turn, so they're going to be able to cast the Swords to Plowshares. What are they going to discard here? Probably not the Solitude, I would imagine. I don't even think they discard anything here. Okay, they drew a Fairy Macabre. That is an interesting one to board in against us when we're not a graveyard-based deck. So we're going to bash for one and get a token here. So I would like to draw a crop rotation. That would be the best card to draw on this turn. If we drop a Blood Moon right now, that's a little bit annoying. Crop rotation, please. We did not draw a crop rotation. That's a sad one. Okay. Play this out. All right. We have a Hex Mage. We're looking for Hand Disruption or Crop Rotation. Our first striker here is actually a worthwhile blocker, and our life total is relevant in this matchup because they are an aggressive, stompy deck. All right, so we know two of the three cards in their hand. Attacking to our first striker. No, they decided against it. And they don't want to play out their Dungeoneer. Okay, this is a great draw. We'll go and get ourselves a delightful little basic forest, I think. For this one. We'll cast the beautiful, the wonderful, Steely Resolve. Name Avatar, which is Marinage's creature type. And we will pass the turn. We have Lethal coming in to our opponent next turn. They can solitude their own guy to stay alive. But depending on which guy they target, we might be able to kill it with the Abrupt Decay. This is where they play Loran of the Third Path, blow up our Steely Resolve, and hold up that thing. Okay, so we've got a Chrome Mox coming in here. We know two of our opponent's cards. Let's see what we put underneath this Chrome Mox. We also can... Oh, I suppose we can't beat... No, we can beat a Blocker, right? Because we have the Abrupt Decay. Seasoned Dungeoneer going under a Chrome Mox. That's the sort of situation our opponent's in here. So... They might have to Solitude their own guy. To stay alive. Okay, they want a treasure token. We have flash strike, so we're blocking. Now two cards in hand. One of them is solitude. So they would need to have something that blows up steely resolve for one mana here. We'll play out this land. We'll go to tax. The solitude can blow itself up to gain in three life. All right, they're just scooping it up. So. We managed a nice 4-1 there. Losing to Doomsday, like a, um, I think it was Doomsday Stormy type thing, and then beating Doomsday in the following round. So 4-1, pretty good. I think the deck tested quite well. We didn't necessarily get to play against all the things we wanted to, but that's the nature of leagues. We gave a good account of ourselves today against Combat Decks, though. Let's talk about the deck. So what I liked, obviously, we're not really going to talk much about the main deck. I think the main deck is pretty much a done deal at this point. But what I will say is... We could, basically, the only things that I'd be tempted to swap in the main deck is the Pithing Needle and in the main deck and the side, and the Not This World and the Cyborg. These two cards can swap around. Whether or not I want to remains to be seen. I think I prefer Pithing Needles right now due to all the Wastelands floating about in all these uh, aggressive, like, Grixis Tempo and Shadow decks. But for the sideboard, our Surgical Extraction... Came up really clutch and actually helped us win games against matchups that are hard. So we used this to beat the Doomsday matchup. So I was a big fan of the Surgical Extraction there. Definitely felt better. The Steely Resolve won us a game just now against the Initiative deck. So it was very much doing its job. And it's just like six ways of protecting our creature that doesn't require mana on the turn we're doing our thing. Because obviously we can crop rotate for a Sejuri step, but that doesn't always uh, doesn't always work. And Sometimes you draw the Sejiri step, for example, like we did in one of our games. Sometimes you might not even have the green mana to go off, or you spent all your mana making your guy and then they kill it, whereas not of this world and Steel Resolve. So Steel Resolve comes down first, and then they have to deal with this before they can deal with your guy, and not of this world is free, so obviously it works in a similar way. Yeah, the whole cyborg configuration looked really good today. I like the fact that the Inquisition of Kozilek allowed us to sort of snipe at some of the other decks and I think this does help a little bit against some of the Blood Mooney decks as well because 
they're usually playing Magus of the Moon. And the Inquisition of Kozilek just hits all the moon effects, whereas Duress doesn't always. And also, this was better against the initiative deck than a Duress would have been. So it was a nice way that we could sort of side grade our boarding and have a little bit more potency going on. Yeah, the deck looks good. I'm quite happy with it. Will I play it at European Legacy Masters? That is the question. Obviously, this is kind of like my signature deck, which means if I play it at one of these big tournaments, it probably comes back to bite me a little bit because people know what I'm playing. So we're going to lose some percentage points by playing it. But also, if we're expecting a lot of the sort of Maverick and Green-White depth decks, then we could be in a spot of bother. Traditionally, Europe has a higher rate of Maverick players than other regions. It's just something that people like, the same way that Japan has a lot more people that play show and tell than other regions. There's just certain certain individual metas in regions. So will this be a good choice for the tournament? I don't know. But I do love the deck. I have this in Old Boarded, all the cards that are in Old Boarded that are available at least. And uh, yeah, big fan of this deck. I think today showcased some stuff pretty well. I think we made a tiny misstep uh, in one of the rounds with our sequencing of lands. But it didn't end up mattering, I don't believe. Uh, we did win that round. So, if you like this deck, please check out the, the Patreon. It's a very detailed prime that I spend a lot of time on. And, you know, it's a nice way to support the channel if that's a thing that interests you as well. Uh, and I'd be very appreciative. Also, remember to like and subscribe. That doesn't cost you anything and really supports the channel, so why not do it? If you're watching this and you're not a subscriber, the question is, why? Apparently, most of my viewers aren't subscribers. Let's see if we can change that around. All right. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.